Look, can I come back for a second? Because as you point out, it's autoimmune, it's an inflammatory disease, and I get the sense from you that I don't like to call it autoimmune because you've never identified an autoantigen target, immune-mediated, I, I have no problem with, but I don't like calling it autoimmune. You jumped we right on it. documented that, that. I was going to go there, and you did it for <laughs> me. Uh, how do we know it's autoimmune? Because I'm, I'm wondering, and I've wondered throughout my career, so many of these diseases we call autoimmune as a wastebasket because we don't know what causes them. Are we sure it's autoimmune, or is there an inciting factor? No, no. I really think if you haven't identified an autoantigen target, you shouldn't be calling it autoimmune. It's not myasthenia gravis. It's not NMO spectrum disorder. There you have autoantigen targets. Okay, let me ask this again. Since we don't identify an autoimmune target, what's causing it? There's no doubt the host immune system is attacking and causing damage within the CNS. It's an immune-mediated disease. That's a definite component. All of our DMTs manipulate the immune system, and they are successful. But what is the trigger? So that's very interesting. You I know. Have, that's why I asked. Okay. You have genetics, and you have environmental factors, very interesting environmental factors. For example, no adult-onset MS case that's not Epstein-Barr virus antibody positive. There's not a single case in the literature of adult onset MS that's EBV seronegative. Why is that? But that's a tricky way to phrase that because a lot of people are Epstein-Barr positive that don't have MS. It's a confluence. Uh -huh. It's a confluence of the genetic makeup of an individual plus what has happened to this individual immunologically. And uh, Pac Hoyle uh, referred to Epstein-Barr virus and keep in mind that Epstein-Barr virus, why, why after you acquire it, it's within your body. Where does it survive? Among other things, it uh, survives in B cells and T cells. What does a virus do in B cells and T cells? It gives this T cell and the B cell an ever so slight survival advantage. So if you were to use this, and I don't want to overstress this, but in a pro-oncogenic kind of a model, it puts the cell up so that it no longer responds in the equal way to the surrounding controlling mechanisms. So it is now a cell that can do things when it should no longer so do it things. it tips a little bit. It's and tipping. so these inflammatory cells start doing things you wish they hadn't done, like chewing up myelin, for example, and gray matter, for example. Or no longer being there when they shouldn't be there. Think of it they when They don't we, defend against something that is attacking. Well, or think of what happens to all the T cells uh, that you have in your body when you get the flu. Uh -huh. At the end, when you clear the flu, the great majority do the decent thing. They apoptose. <laughs> they die. If you have an ever so slight survival advantage because of Epstein-Barr virus, you may not go away when you should go away, which then leads to an ongoing autoimmune disease or immune activation, depending on our terminology.